much to all of you. We have already got the golden opportunity from hearing from Professor Uday Maitra. He is already here. So, uh, witnessing some spectacular experiments and a captivating talk in some moments. And so, without any further ado, let's start. Recognize him. His name is 
I. I. Ravi, who discovered something very important, for which he got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1944, and I will now highlight what the property did that he discovered. You can recognize it right now, right? Nuclear magnetic resonance. Actually, the French say R M N, so it's in the right order for the French. All right. <clears throat> so I'm also going to ask you questions. Okay. So here's the first question. What do these numbers tell you? You, you guys don't answer. Anybody from here? Uh, near their entrance, 
And these are samples of stable elements which um, are listed, which are displayed here. And there's a more impressive display of the periodic table uh, in front of a very well-known person in the office. Bill Gates, you're the right, you've got the right answer. So even for somebody who has very little to do with the periodic table, very little to do with chemistry, he has this uh, beautiful uh, real elements periodic table. In fact, he has even a, a, a neon discharge with N E with a symbol written there. All right, so that, that was question number two. <clears throat> okay, let me now go back. I will not go into get into the history of the periodic table, how elements were discovered. I will go through some slides rather quickly. And some of these slides came from uh, Sam Sengupta's uh, talk, uh, which I heard quite some time back. So matter, different types of matter, substances, okay, always fascinated human beings, right from the ancient times. And the Greek and the Indian philosophers, they recognized four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Okay. Those of you who have studied some Sanskrit know the equivalent Sanskrit names uh, in, uh, in the Indian context. And, and some of them even gave some sort of a shape to smaller units or the fragments from which these elements or these substances have been made up of. Tetrahedron is fire, dodecahedron is the universe, ecosahedron is water, octahedron is air, cube is earth, and things like that. But research towards the discovery of elements really started when British gases were discovered. So Daniel Rutherford discovered nitrogen, Henry Cavendish discovered hydrogen. And look at the years, 1766. 1772, very little science was known at that time. Uh, subsequently, oxygen was discovered uh, by Christie and by Lavoisier, and you probably have read some uh, something called the life of Lavoisier. He was one of those who actually coined the name ele elements, and he also organized the elements known at that time with their names, because many things were known by different names in different countries. So in this particular book, uh, he, in fact, gave new names for the elements uh, from, for example, air was called, oxygen was called air pyjal, okay, and air deflogistic. So he gave the name oxygen to oxygen. And similarly, he gave many other names. Some of them are, uh, you, you will be able to recognize, and some of them you probably would not because those have changed. So I will not say much more about the voice here because that will take one full hour. But you know that uh, around the age of 50, he was, his head was cut off. He was guillotined uh, for other reasons. And at that time, many important people in Paris went to the king to save his life. And the king said, you know, the law should take its course. The world has no need for chemists or scientists. Things would be very different uh, in, uh, in today's context. Here's an interesting plot. You know, every year, you see new mobile phones coming up. Okay, I'll come back to the issue of mobile phones to the end of my presentation. But every year, you see new models. Okay. And what drives these new models? New dis discovery of new technology. Right? And here, what I've plotted is a somewhat lousy plot, uh, not very clear. But what you see here is the number of elements discovered, this is 100, as a function of time. 1750, 1800, 1900, 1950, and so on. And what is indicated here is that these were known in the you know, old days, less than 10. But every time a new technique appeared, a new technology was discovered, the discovery of new elements skyrocketed. But not skyrocketed, but increased. Here is new analytical methods just after 1800. Electrochemistry around 1810, 1815, and so on, and a very large number of elements were discovered by electrolysis. As you perhaps know, Humphrey Davy uh, discovered many of these uh, highly reactive elements, including potassium. This is 18 post 1850 spectral analysis. Many elements were discovered at that time. You see indium here. Um, indium, in particular, is not named after India. 
is named after an indigo line that is found in a spectrum. So it's very clear that the spectral analysis uh, allowed people to identify the indigo line in the atomic spectrum of India. Then there's a lot of research on rare arts. Um, I'll come back to rare arts and tell you that, you know, show you that rare arts are really not that rare. And again, many rare arts were discovered at that time. This is uh, noble, gases. Noble, gases. Noble, gases. noble gases. So noble gas research started towards the end of the 18th century, 19th century, and quite a few are discovered. Our institute has some connection with noble gas discovery. You know what? Ramsey's collaborator was Morris Travers, who was our first director. Okay, so he discovered some of these gases. Krypton, neon, um, I guess helium is here, helium was separate, and so on. Um, neutron bombardment towards the end of the Manhattan Project uh, led to the discovery of most of the transuranic elements. And past 1950, all the super heavy elements, all the heavy actinides, have been discovered by heavy atom bombardment, not just neutron bombardment. Okay. So this gives you some idea about you know, how new technology triggered the discovery of new elements. Uh, I will go through the history very, very quickly. So this is one of the early attempts by Dove Reiner, who found that elements in groups of three, which, whose properties were similar, you know, they, had, they showed some pattern. The pattern was that the oxides of calcium, strontium, and barium, which have similar properties, strontium was sort of the mean geometrical, uh, the arithmetic mean of calcium and barium oxide equivalent weights. So the concept of equivalent weight was known at that time. And he also showed bromine is halfway between chlorine and iodine, sodium is halfway between lithium and potassium. So they were trying to find some pattern to group the known elements together. So this was the first attempt by Dobreiner. Then a young uh, lad, Ernst Lenzen, he in expanded this trial to 20 trials. So 20 times 3, nearly 60 elements. And again, you see that at that time, the only thing that was associated with each element was the atomic weight, or equivalent weight of compounds. So that's how they were, they tried out that, uh, <coughs> If you look at the atomic weights, uh, you can get this kind of a trial pattern. Another inorganic chemist from Germany, Schmelin, he also made a very primitive form of periodic table, again using uh, this triad system. And uh, there have been many other uh, derivatives of this particular plot, which I'll skip today. There was another early table which is associated with Newlands, and it's called Newlands octave. He first showed that every eighth element had a very similar property. And again, I will skip this particular slide. So it gave some impression that there must be a periodic law. There must be a law that governed this repeating properties uh, found in the elements. <clears throat> then Lothar Meyer, he was only 32. He produced a table of 28 elements in 19, 1862, seven years before Mendeleev's work on the periodic table. And what they were trying to do is to look for elements with similar properties and look at the difference in the atomic weights. For example, carbon, silicon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, sulfur, you see the difference is very close to 16. Okay. Now comes the story of Mendeleev. Uh, you can read about Mendeleev in hundreds of websites, uh, including Wikipedia. But the story goes that he was the youngest of 17 children, and he kind of came from a very poor family, somewhere in, a, in the middle of nowhere in Siberia. But his mother realized he had something very special. And despite the hardship faced by the family, because they had a glass blowing shop, a glass shop of some kind, apparently that was destroyed in a fire and they had no money to eat. But in spite of that, Mendeleev uh, and his mother came to Moscow. Okay. And uh, I actually, when I talk to kids, I wear a periodic tie, which came from Moscow, so I connect Mendeleev with a tie. But in Moscow, 
Moscow State University, where my dad came from, um, did not admit him because he did not really, was not fit, um, good enough to be admitted to the Moscow State University. So his mother took him to St. Petersburg. And perhaps you know, in between the time when USSR existed, uh, St. Petersburg was renamed as Leningrad. So St. Petersburg State University took him because his Medic's father apparently studied there. And then initially he was a student, he graduated, he did a, he went, this is an artist impression of uh, St. Petersburg in those days. And when he eventually got a job after submitting his thesis, he apparently did a thesis on uh, properties of water alcohol mixtures. Turns out that some of my students are actually working on water alcohol mixture uh, after 150 years, but unconnected with what Mendeleev did. Uh, but um, he was asked to teach in St. Petersburg after he submitted his thesis. He found that there were just far too many elements and there's no way to organize them. So he said, okay, I will write my book from which I will, I will teach. So he completed the first volume in 1868 using six, eight elements out of 63. And then he said, you know, 55 more elements are there. I have to write a second volume. It's just too much work. If I have to write each element separately, perhaps that's what he wrote in the first volume. Okay. 55 more elements. So he, he looked at the properties. And he figured out that there must be something that pulls them together. There must be some periodicity or some property, some law that he can use to group them together, make a table. And there's a story, and, and again, you, you can see that he was, this is from his own writing. He is looking at the difference between carbon, silicon, nitrogen, phosphorus. Of course, he was guided by what others did by that time. Okay, so he knew about this. And by that time, atomic weight determination became more accurate. So atomic weights were more accurate. This is again scribbling from his notebook. And the story goes that one night he wrote the names of 65 known elements on his little cards, one element per card, and wrote the fundamental properties of every element on the card, including the atomic weight. And he thought that atomic weight must play a very significant role. And then again the story goes that he was playing with his cards in his desk, and while doing this he fell asleep hours of playing around with the cars. And then he apparently said to somebody that I saw in a dream a table where all elements fell into place as required. Awakening, I immediately wrote it down on a piece of paper. Only one place did a correction later seem necessary. 